Six years and God is just getting started. I want to hear somebody. Woo, God. You know, it's still a jungle out there, but it's less of a jungle than it used to be because over the past six years, we've seen 676 people surrender their lives to Jesus. And we'll see more today, and we'll see more this week, and we'll see more baptism of, baptisms of people declaring faith in Christ. I can't believe what God has done and what he is doing. And so we're going to continue a, a message a series we started last week called God is Bigger. And I'll start by just acknowledging something that, that we'd all have to agree this is true if we're honest. And, and we should be honest, we're in church. So, But if we're being honest, we would have to agree that We've made some mistakes in the past. Like, there's things that you and I have done that we wish we could have taken back. Like, like you've ever done this? I've done this a couple times. Um, you ever uh, send out a text to the wrong person? <laughs> is there a worse feeling? I mean, is, it, that could be so awkward. Like, texting your significant other. It's like, hey, hey, hot mama. Yeah, how you doing, right? So, yeah, can't wait to see you later tonight for a little boom, chicka, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden, sending, instead of sending it to your hot mama, you send it to your real mama? <laughs> Here's what I know about you in that situation. You're getting a phone call pretty quick, right? Honey, are you okay? It's like, mom, I didn't mean to. Uh, what do you mean, boom, chicka, boom? I, mom, it's a popcorn brand. Don't worry about it. It's like, it's like don't, we, nothing. Let it go. But I, we've all made mistakes. We've all done stupid things. Some of those mistakes have a name, right? What, ladies? Maybe someone you dated? And then you give them a name, right? It's like, it's like uh, Michael. Mistake, right? He was a mistake. Tony, Two-Face, Sam, Psychopath. You know, you, you, we give them these names. That, um, but we, we all have stuff that we've done, baggage that we maybe still carry with us. And it can weigh us down. And it can hold you back. And for some, it is. And that's why God brought you here today, is it's holding you back from what God has for you. And not only is it holding you back the past, but it's actually hindering your future. Do you know why? Because you start believing the lies. You start believing the lies like, I, I, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe no one's going to love me and no one's ever going to love me. And, and, and maybe my best days are behind me. Maybe I will never succeed in anything. Maybe my past mistakes do define me. I'm here to tell you something, to declare something over you, that God, say God, God is bigger than your past. For people, I mean, this is one of the number one things I talk to people about is where they've been, what they've done, and how it pulls them or holds them from where God wants to take them. Now, if there's anybody in the Word of God, and there's a lot of people with a lot of past in the Word of God, but if there's anybody that I would point a finger at in the Word of God and say, ooh, that boy's got a past, it'd be Peter. Peter is one of the best friends of Jesus, if you don't know, one of his closest disciples. And Peter, he... He had issues. You know, have you ever heard the saying, um, think before you speak? You heard that saying, right? Well, Peter had dyslexic when it, he was, when it, he, he got that turned around, he got that mixed around. So, my wife always tells me, you don't have to say everything you think. That's what Jody says. The problem is, I, after I, it, I don't think of that until after I say it. But that's neither here nor there. Peter, Peter had moments. Peter is uh, recorded in the eternal word of God, and I guarantee there are stories that he wish, probably he wishes weren't in there. I'm going to give you a snapshot of four different stories out of the Word of God. Just quick little snidbits. I want you to see how messed up Peter was. I want you to see the mistakes that he made. The thing about Peter, he was so bold with his faith. And he, was, he, he, would, he would rise up on a mountaintop with things he would say and do. But then he would quickly fall and send that text to the wrong person. I mean, he made mistakes like one time Peter walked on water. The only one besides Jesus to ever do it. But that high only lasted for a few seconds because as we read Matthew 14, 29, just a couple verses, look what happened. So Peter went off the other side of the boat and he walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. And what happened? He began to sink. 
Save me, Lord, save me. He shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabs Peter. And he says, you have so little faith. Why do you doubt me? It's like wah, wah, wah. Right? It was, it was so good for just so short amount of time. And then it was not so good anymore. It happened again when, when Jesus, one time he asked the disciples, he said, who do you say that I am? Who, who am I? And Peter's like, you're the son of God. You're the savior of the world, Jesus. And Jesus is like, you're, you nailed it, Peter. You're right on. And on faith like that, Peter, uh, that's a rock. I mean, you, you, that's a rock foundation. And on that rock, Peter, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And Peter's all puffed up and feeling good about it. He's like, yeah, if you smell what the rock is cooking. You know, he's all jacked up. But, but moments, seconds later, it is a downward spiral. Because Jesus would continue the conversation. And Jesus says, he starts to cast more vision. And he says, yep, on this rock I'll build my church. And I'm going to go away, and I'm going to be crucified, and I'll die. But I'll rise again three days later. And Peter, oh, this is so good. Peter decides to rebuke the Son of God. Yeah, that's not going to be good. So I'll read it to you in Matthew 16, 22. But Peter takes aside the Lord Jesus Christ and begins to reprimand him. Yeah, for saying these things. Jesus, heaven forbid this will ever happen to you. Jesus turns and looks at Peter and says, get away from me, Satan. Okay, I've been called a lot of things, but I mean, Satan, you're a dangerous trap for me. Peter, you see things from merely a human point of view, not from God's. Holy cow, Peter went from here to here in seconds. Jesus would eventually get to this point that he's, that he's prophesying about. And when they're in the garden and Jesus is getting arrested... It's another bad moment for Peter. Peter's aggression, Peter's temper, Peter's anger flares up. It, so they're in the garden. I'll read it to you in John 18. They're arresting Jesus, and Peter draws his sword and slashes off the right ear of one of the, the, the soldiers, of Malchus, a, a high priest slave. Goes reservoir dogs on him, if you know, you know. But he slashes off his ear. But Peter, or Jesus, said to Peter, oh boy, Peter, put your sword back in the sheath. Put it back in. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering that the Father has given me? In other words, Peter, now you're getting in the way of, the, the, of my ministry again. Now, you think you're doing the right thing, but you're not, kind of like the other time. You, you, you're holding me back from what I need to do. It, it's crazy. Now, if you don't really recognize any of those three little stories, that's okay. That's why we're doing this together. There might be one, even if you're not a church person, like you didn't really maybe grow up going to church, you probably have heard of this next one. It would be the biggest, like, mistake that Peter is known for. It, it, it's, it's when Jesus, again, it's right before they're on their way to the garden, and Jesus is, is telling them, you know, disciples, you're all going to leave. You're all going to desert me. And Peter says it. Not me, Jesus. I'm with you all the way. If they do it, I'll, I'll never do it. You ever told God that? You ever said, God, I I'll never do it again. Only to do it again? So, so Peter, Peter, you know, if we're honest, we've all denied Christ, right? But, but, but Jesus says to Peter, this is what he says. He says, before the rooster crows, Peter... Before the rooster crows tonight. That's how long your commitment's going to last. Tonight. And Peter's like, Peter's like you, you don't, there's no way. There's no way. I want to read to you and show you that there was a way. This is how it went down. Matthew 26, 69. Just imagine this scene. So the Lord, the ear was cut off. By the way, the Lord Jesus Christ healed that, that man's ear on the spot. Right? Surgery. Boom. Like that. Done. They arrest Jesus. They take him off. The disciples are like, what the? Even though Jesus said this was going to happen, they're not getting it. And this is what happens. Now Peter sat outside the courtyard, and a little servant girl comes up saying, hey, weren't you also with that Jesus that got arrested, that Jesus of Galilee? But Peter denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're saying. Say that's one time. Say that's one time. 
That's one time. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and quizzed him and said, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Say, that's twice. That's twice now. It's coming true right before our eyes. A little later, some people are standing by Peter. And a person says, surely you are also one of them. Your speech betrays you. In other words, you have that accent. You talk like him. And what does Peter do? Then Peter, listen to this. This is how adamant he is. This is how much of a, how fallen Peter is. He curses and swears and says, I don't know the man. Say that's three. And immediately, the rooster crows. I mean, this is, this is the same day that he said, I'll never. They'll leave probably. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. And Jesus is like, ah, oh, Peter. Can you, oh, by the way, uh, this is, I love the word of God because as you read the Gospels, which is the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you get, you get different um, angles of the story. So what, what Matthew didn't record, Luke did. And as soon as Jesus, or as soon as Peter denied Jesus the third time, Luke says, and then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, can you imagine? The third time, the rooster crows, it hits him. And I, I guarantee every time a rooster ever crowed after that, it, it, it'd bring Peter right back to his past, right back to his failures, right back to his mistakes. The Lord turns and looks at Peter. He doesn't just look at Peter. He looks at him with, with blackened eyes, right? A swollen face and blood running down his cheeks from a crown of thorns that's been gouged into his head. That's how he looks at Peter. And, and, and Peter runs off after seeing that, of course. And I'm telling you, at this moment in our message, at this moment in Peter's life, this is a pivotal point. And some of you, this is where you're at. And if you've been there, you know it. And if you're not there, there's a good chance you will be someday. It's a pivotal point in his ministry and in his life. What are you going to do, Peter? Are you going to, are you going to stay in that moment of, of, of sadness and regret and remorse or are you going to do something different? When I tell that story about Peter, I think back to my days of being in drug addiction and then hiding it from family and friends and all that. And I'll never forget that when I went to rehab the first time, you know, I, I make promises, make promises to my wife Jody. Make, as I held Ava as a little baby, I, I make promises to her that, you know, I, I'm, I, this was, I'm, I'm a new man. I, it'll, I'll never do that again. I'll never do that. Only to do that again. Only to have to look back in the eyes of my wife, Jody and say, yeah, I did that. Only to hold Ava as a little baby again and say, I remember sitting in church just like you're doing. It was, oh my gosh, in, be, in between my rehab stints, I'm sitting in church and I'm weeping. And I'm weeping just like Peter wept after the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I'm weeping because my past is so pulling me back in. Because I know that I, I am dead in the water where I'm at. Even though I'm in church, I'm a dead man. And, and I, I felt so worthless. And that was a pivotal moment, just like Peter was at. What, what am, I, am, I going to, am I going to face forward and walk by faith? Or am I going to keep looking backward? Jake and I right now, my 16-year-old, we're doing driving lessons, right, Jake? Still learning to drive stick shift, and uh, it's, it's fun. But, but sometimes when you're learning a new thing like driving stick, you can forget about just the regular things like that you learn in driver's ed. So we're driving one day, and, and uh, I said, Jake, look behind you. You know, check your blind spot. Check the rearview mirror. I said, but just check. Just glance. Don't be staring in the rearview mirror. If you stare, I mean, you look in that thing for 20 seconds. Well, you and I are going to die in this car, okay? That's what's going to happen. So you glance at what's behind you. Don't miss this. You glance at what's behind you. That's okay. That just keeps you safe. That just makes sure you know where you're going and that you're moving forward. But you gaze at what's ahead of you. See, there's a reason, somebody told me this one time, there's a reason the rearview mirror, Aiden, is really small, but the windshield is huge. Why would that be? Because you're not supposed to stare in the rearview mirror. 
Because if you focus on your past and what's behind you and what's holding you back, it will always hold you back. And you will never move forward. Or if you do move forward, you're going to run into danger quickly. So we glance at our past. You don't need to forget it. We learn from it. But we gaze at what's forward. In other words, and what's forward? Don't miss this. You know what God had waiting for Peter? And everybody else that desert, deserted him and what God has waiting for you? And me and even in our, in our mistakes and even in our mess? Grace. Grace. The grace of God. And I wrote this down. God's grace, and don't miss it, is greater than your past. See, God's grace ahead of you is greater than that past that is behind you. And that's the way that we have to start living and loving and believing. And, and will Peter recognize that grace? Will we? And you might be thinking, I don't know. I mean, I get God's grace. I've heard of it before. I'm not sure what it is. But, but I've done some bad things. Like some of you, you can't believe you didn't light on fire when you walked in here. You were convinced you were going to do it. So... I've done real bad things, Pastor. Do me a favor. Turn and just look at some people around you right now. Just look at them. Just glance at somebody next to you, around you, behind you, in front of you. Okay? Now understand something about the people that you just glanced at. If you knew everything they did, you'd run. I'm just saying. You would run. Some of you, you're married to that person. You know, right? It's just, we would run from that if we knew everything. God knows everything. That's why I love that we're a church. We haven't said this enough lately. We're a church where it's okay to not be okay. If you're addicted, welcome home. If you're struggling in your marriage, we're glad you're here. If you're down with depression, I'm telling you there's hope. If you've been divorced, well, praise God that he doesn't shut the door on your future because of something that happened in your past. You're welcome here because God's grace is greater than your past. And he ain't done with you yet. He just getting started. But we got to make a decision. Will I, will I glance and learn and look forward? Or will I just keep looking backward and never move forward or move, move forward in a dangerous situation? God's grace is greater than your past. God's not done with you. God wasn't done with Peter. I gave you a few snapshots of things that Peter did wrong. Can I show you a few of what Peter did right? Can I show you a few of what Peter did when he finally understood, realized, and accepted the grace and forgiveness of God? In Acts, that whole book of the word of God is about the early church. Purpose groups, you know that. You're reading through it. It's, it's huge. In Acts 2... Peter preaches the first church message. 3,000 people are saved from their sins. In Acts 3, Peter heals a man who had been paralyzed since birth. Don't miss Acts 5, it gets nuts. The word of God says they were bringing sick people in beds, dragging them into the street. Do you know why? Just to get them to fall in the shadow of Peter. Apparently, Peter, Peter's shadow was healing people. You can't make this up. And if those, those snapshots don't impress you, what I'm about to share next, I guarantee you should. It's in Acts 9. It hit me so hard when I read it recently. I'd read it before, but it never hit me like it did this time. I mean, if we think of the greatest miracle that God could ever do this side of heaven, the most phenomenal thing that God could do, I mean, other than getting two people to agree at where to eat the first time, right? I mean, we know that even Jesus can't do that. But uh, other than that, what's the greatest miracle that you could ever witness? Man. Well, I don't know what you're thinking in your head right now, but I'll read what, what Peter did, and we'll see if it lines up to what you're thinking. In Acts 9, I'm going to read a few verses here. This is the early church again. In Acts 9, 36, there was a believer in this city named Joppa, named Tabitha. In the Greek, her name was Dorcas. I would have kept Tabitha as well. So anyway, so she, she was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. But about this time, listen to this, she became ill and she died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby in Lydda, 
So they sent two men to get him. Please come as soon as possible. They've never, Peter's never heard that before. I mean, Jesus heard that a lot. Hey, this person's sick. Hey, this person's dead. We need Jesus. Well, now they're asking for Peter. So Peter returned with them, and as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The room was filled with widows and people that were weeping and showing him the coats and other things that Tabitha had made for them, all the great things she did while she was alive. Peter asked them all to leave. Just like Jesus would do. Then he knelt and prayed. Turning to the body, Peter says, get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the other believers and presented her, Tabitha, to them alive. Peter. I, I know Jesus rose people from the dead. Did it more than once. Peter? The denier? He is raising people from the dead. Does it get any bigger than that? Oh, I contend it does. And the next verse shows it. What's better than raising somebody physically? Raising them spiritually. Verse 42. The news spread through the whole town. And many, say many, many, many believed in the Lord. Because Peter didn't give up. Because Peter didn't give in, give in. Many people believed and went from death to life. Oh, I need somebody to know something today. There is no sin. There is no mistake. There is no habit. There is no addiction. There is no problem, past, present, or future, that disqualifies you from the grace of God. And that grace is greater than your past. you got to believe it. You gotta understand, if God can do that through Peter, that same Holy Spirit power is here, in the room, wants to be in you. God's grace, the unmerited, undeserved blessing of God. That's what it is. Favor, they call it. Someone does you a favor, that's something they do nice for you that you didn't even have coming. You, they just blessed you in a way, right? The people that are getting baptized that you're going to witness in a few minutes, they're, they're not getting baptized by anything that they earned or did. They're getting baptized because of the grace of God. That's why. If you knew all of their past, you would see they were, they're totally disqualified from anything that would say that they've earned anything good up here. Because they haven't. They've earned a lot of bad, just like you and just like me. But God's grace, do you know, by the way, the number one thing that people will say when I, when I ask them, when we talk about baptism, they've given their life to Jesus, and I say, hey, you should think about baptism, that's the next step. Do you know the number one thing that holds people back? Their past. Or what they're currently doing. And I'll hear things like, ah, but I'm still, I'm just not ready. And I'll be like, why aren't you ready? I mean, you surrender your life to Christ, you've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been saved and set free. What's going on? Well, I'm still doing the same. I'm still looking at that, you know, I'm still going to those websites. I'm still talking that way. I'm still acting that way. You know? So the number one, the number one reason is I'm still doing some things. Actually, I have also heard, somebody just recently told me they didn't want to get baptized because they were, like, afraid of water. And I just explained to them, I said, listen, it's not that big of a deal. We hold you down. And, to, and then when the bubbles stop, we bring you up. So I don't think I helped. Uh, so <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> people are in the, getting baptized what so by far listen it's not what you do that qualifies you for the God's grace and getting baptized and going from death to life or heaven to hell because or hell to heaven that's the difference it's not anything you do it's it's what Jesus has already done see it, it, it's God's grace upon you that you receive but you didn't do it Jesus did it for God so loved the world, he acted. Your actions disqualify you, and so do mine. You're, but I do good things. Your good things will not earn you anything. You, I love you do good things. Love it. Should. But they're never going to earn you a seat in the Baptist, baptistry. They're never going to earn you a seat in the kingdom of heaven. They're not going to earn you anything. It's only God's grace. I heard, 
this is so cool. God's timing is impeccable. Someone, I don't even know who it was, so it'll probably, probably somebody here. Uh, I cannot remember things. This is terrible. Don't do drugs. So anyway, so I, uh, I don't know who sent it, but somebody sent me a message, uh, a clip, a video clip, uh, just this week. And it was a, a clip of a pastor, and he's talking just like this. And he's telling a story of a guy that was contemplating Christianity. He's contemplating, do I accept God's grace? Call on the name of Jesus Christ, believe he's the son of God, and ask him to forgive me and make me new. Do I do, I do this act of accepting salvation, new life in Christ? And, and, and the, young, the young man says to the pastor, because he's kind of quizzing him, he says, so if I become a Christian, do I gotta do I gotta quit smoking pot? And the pastor's like, no. Right now somebody's like, yes, only at Meadows Church, right? So <laughs> do I gotta quit smoking? And, and the guy's like, ah, I don't think you're I don't think you understand, Pastor. Kind of an old pastor. He's like, ah, he doesn't get it. He, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is if I accept Christ and become a follower of Jesus, do I, I gotta quit smoking marijuana? And the pastor's like, no, you don't. And he says, I don't understand. I, I, he goes, I don't get it. And the pastor's like, I, no, you don't get it. He says, let me ask you a question. When you're getting in the shower, do you clean yourself up first and then get in the shower? He's like, no, I get in the shower and get cleaned up. He says, that's how it is with Jesus. He says, you don't come here having to get cleaned up ahead of time. You don't come to Christ having to get cleaned up. You come to Christ and you commune with him, you be with him, you pray to him, you talk to him, you cry with him, you get ticked at him, you have a relationship with him, and in that process, he cleans you up. Does that make sense? That's what he does. It, so, so don't let what you're currently doing stop you from what God wants to do in and through you. That's what you need to understand. It, Peter was one of the closest friends of Jesus. And after their three and a half years of doing life together with, with, the, with the Messiah, the Son of God, at the end, what was Peter? He was a habitual liar who had a huge anger issue. That's how much Jesus changed him in those three and a half years. He, he was still pretty dirty and messy, I think. I mean, he denied his best friend three times. That's messy. That's muddy. Peter was not cleaned up. But, at, but, but, but eventually, as they walked together, it took, I gave my life to Christ. It would take me years to, to, to filter my language. I didn't even try to do it, but God did it. And it's gotten, you know, so much. I mean, it's just, he changes you. I didn't give financially. I love talking about that because I was such a heathen about that. It took me years to get around returning to God that it didn't just happen. God had to clean me up. God had to renew me daily. You know what I'm saying? It did. You don't just like boom and you're there. But I'll tell you something that did happen that really radically changed Peter. And don't miss this. This is so key that we catch this. Oh, by the way, God showed me this. After that whole, do you have to quit smoking pot, that thing? Here's what I wrote down. When Jesus changes who you are, it will eventually change what you do. I love that. When the Lord changes who you are, when, when, he, when he goes from here, you know about him, to you knowing him, eventually, you may not quit looking at porn tomorrow, but I promise you, if you keep seeking him, talking to him, embracing him, reading about him, uh, crying out to him, I promise you, eventually, it will change what you do. We're just impatient people. Thank God he's a patient God. So Peter, this is what gets me. Here's what really changed Peter. The time he walked with Jesus, yes, every day would transform him a little bit. But like we just said, after three and a half years, he was still fallen, messed up, liar. You know what really, where the radical change really happened? Is when Peter believed an event when Peter saw something he, that he didn't think he would ever see, when he realized something he never thought he would ever realize, he heard about it from Jesus, he just, like, he just didn't. The resurrection of Jesus Christ 
I came to tell somebody who thought they were good, had to be good to get in God's good graces. You thought you had to be good. Good people go to heaven. Bad people go to hell. That is wrong theology. People that aren't covered by the grace of God go to hell. People that are covered by the grace of God go to heaven. That's correct theology. How are you covered by the grace of God? Accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Believe he died on a cross. And believe in an event that he rose from the dead. We can't stop just at the cross, and I'll tell you why. Thousands died crucified on a cross. But one man. One man didn't stay dead. And when Peter saw that, I like to say, before the resurrection, before Jesus died and rose from the dead, see, see Peter, Peter thought Jesus was the Son of God. He even said it, you're the Son of God. Before the resurrection, Peter thought he was the Son of God. But three days after, or three days after the cross, when Jesus rose from the dead, met Peter face to face, Peter went from not just thinking Jesus is the Son of God to knowing Jesus is the Son of God. I'm telling somebody, the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. And if it hasn't changed you, you just haven't sold out to him yet. The resurrection is the key. Believe in that. Call on the name of Jesus. He brought himself back to life. He gave Peter the power to bring people back to life. Peter's no more special than you. No more anointed than you with Christ in you. So why can't he do it in you? You thought you were coming here to watch a baptism. I guarantee God brought you here to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to know that his grace is enough to save, but you have to receive it. Most people won't. Why not? I can't answer that. I just know that when you're broken and dead and you're desperate and you realize that there's somebody there that wants to make you new, you'll fall at his feet. You'll fall at the foot of the cross and say, I need you. I need you. I need you. I want to invite the people that are getting baptized to come up for the 9 o'clock service. As they come up, I want you to check out this video and watch this. My name is Maria Garibo. How has Jesus changed my life? I would like to say that he has brought me peace. While being in college, I used to stress a lot and overthink my future. And with him, he has brought me happiness. I not only live happier now, I don't stress about school. I know that with him by my side, I can conquer the world and I will do great in life. My name is Quinn. Jesus has changed my life just ever since I've been in the Word. Day to day, I'm just a better person. I feel like a better person. I want to get baptized. Um, the more and more I thought about it, they're just, I'm making up a lot of excuses and the excuses need to be done. Hi, my name's Kylie. Jesus changed my life by making me more happy overall. He's made me more optimistic for tomorrow. And he's given me somebody I can be truly vulnerable around, even if it's hard. I want to get baptized so I can show my faith to others and so I can show God that I believe in Him and I want to follow Him. My name is Christopher Michael Johnston and I believe in Jesus Christ. I want to get baptized because I was baptized at birth, but I've never been baptized ever since after my birth and I've always wanted to because I want to show God and Jesus that they are in my mind, heart, and soul. Yeah, I just want them to know that. My name is Leanne. Jesus has changed my life by ridding my mind and heart of past trauma, negativity, anger, unhappiness, and has made my life just within a short two months a much more happy and peaceful life that I've been needing. Baptism to me means like a promise. I am publicly announcing that I am a forgiven follower and promise to live for him and by him. My name is Lindsay and Jesus has changed my life, well, by saving my life first. I was in a really dark spot. I felt a nudge and I started coming to church and as soon as I surrendered my life to him, he started filling my cup up with peace and happiness and, and love and just something that I, I can't describe almost. <laughs> Baptism to me is a declaration of changing your ways completely and changing your ways of like living and thinking and just trusting Jesus alone in my salvation and showing him that I'm willing to serve him and to follow him no matter the cost.
My name is Sam and Jesus has changed my life in so many different ways, but starting with just the mentality to serve and want to serve and enjoy serving and, and experiencing joy in that. For me, the reason I want to get baptized would be it's the next step of obedience for me. I think for a long time I would explain off not needing to get baptized because I was already, you know, a Christian, I was serving in the church, or what if I get baptized and people judge me? What if they look at me differently or whatever because I haven't been baptized yet? And then it came to a point where, you know, it was no longer about me or my embarrassment or my shame, but more so the obedience to serving Jesus, not only as my savior, but also uh, as the master of my life. My name is Owen and Jesus has changed my life by teaching me the difference between right and wrong. Now that I've read the Bible and I believe in Jesus and God, I feel a gut feeling in my heart that it is wrong. My name is Nicole Marquez. Jesus has changed my life because without him I realized that my life was unmanageable. It was a mess. I thankfully found Meadows Church and here I am ready to get baptized and I'm so excited. I've strayed away for a long time and uh, it's time to make our relationship official. My name is Caitlin and Jesus has changed my life in many ways but I would say the biggest thing that he's helped me with recently is um, shining a light on gratitude and grace. Even though I feel like my relationship with Christ has grown over the last few years, every time baptisms rolled around, I kept making an excuse to why I shouldn't. I, you know, I wasn't good enough, or I'm not patient enough, I don't read my Bible, things like that. But I really felt like God was pushing me to take my, this step out of my comfort zone this month and get baptized. My name is Anuvia Olivar, and Jesus has not only changed my life, but he has saved my life. I now see myself in the way that God sees me. Before I even established a relationship with Jesus Christ or even knew Him, I felt like I had no real purpose in my life. And then Jesus walked into my life and He gave me a whole new purpose. He taught me strength and forgiveness and patience that I myself could not find for myself. And even though I fail Him often and there's days where I don't feel like I'm worthy enough of His love or His favor or His forgiveness, He shows up and He still shows me it. And I just want to give all glory to, to Him, to Jesus, and I just want to do my best for Him. My name is Terry. I'm here to get baptized because I shouldn't be here at all. I had an accident seven years ago at work. The person who saved me wasn't supposed to be there. And for seven years, I was just going through life like nothing happened. You know, everybody would have got that lucky. And then I had a friend who died um, in April. So I started coming to church, hoping, hoping this could all make sense. And then we did the city serve. It was like just realization right there. God wasn't done with me yet, and I needed to be thankful for that second chance. This is my way of showing that I accept Him, and I'm signing my life over to Him, and that everything is in His control now. Hey, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today, but don't stop there. Like or subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video, update, or message. And not only that, share this message with a friend or somebody that you know, so many people out there need hope and encouragement, and you have the ability to bring that to them. Finally, if you're in the Omaha area, we would love to have you join us. We would love to meet you. God bless you.